Welcome to a very special episode of Experience Focus Leaders Podcast. I am delighted uh, to introduce you to Kevin Mahaffey. Kevin is a co-founder, uh, CTO, now on the board of Lookout, uh, which is one of the cybersecurity leaders. Uh, he is also, very fortunately for us, an investor in Relate to, but more importantly, he's an investor in over 100 uh, seed and pre-seed companies where um, 10 of them have become unicorns. Some of those names you may know, like Airtable, People.ai. And so welcome to the pot, Kevin. Thanks for having me, Alex. Uh, excited to be here. Great. Well, look, the audience um, you know, wants to know about um, the story of founding Lookout, because particularly in your case, you started coding at age eight. Uh, and you were what people would describe or you described yourself as a hacker. And then you went on and built uh, a unicorn in providing security, ultimately for the enterprises as well. And so that journey must be, you know, must be very interesting. So tell us about the founding story behind it. And, you know, where did you take it? Uh, we, we started the company a while back. Um, myself, John and James, my co-founders, um, we found uh, a lot of mobile phones were just starting to connect computers. Um, they had Bluetooth. Uh, and, and you have to understand now it seems pretty pedestrian that a phone and a computer can talk. But back then, phones were these islands that that you know were, were totally separate. And the thing we know is that as soon as things could talk to computers, they become hackable. Um, and so we had a, you know, one example of a phone we found was a Nokia 6310i, a black and white phone, candy bar shaped, had snake, black and white screen. Many people had it. Um, we found like that and, and honestly, many other phones from other manufacturers as well, you could more or less fully take over the phone, read text messages, read someone's contact list, you know, turn the phone into a bug. Um, and we, you know, we, we found lots of holes and we tried to get the manufacturers to fix them. And at that time, the firmware update processes were so archaic, you would have to like bring your phone into a store and like wait 30 minutes. So it was basically impossible to patch them. Wow. And mm -hmm. so we saw that this was going to be a really big problem. And so what we did is we we wanted to like raise awareness. And uh, one of the things we did was go to the Oscars and uh, hack the red carpet. So what we, we put this device into a backpack. We stood across the street from the red carpet. We were with ABC World News at the time. Um, and we we basically scanned all the celebrities' phones as they went into the Oscars and showed all the data we hypothetically could take. We we notably didn't actually steal any data because you know violating federal law on national te television is not not a good look. Um, but you know we we showed what we could do, and then in the lab, here's what if we had pressed this button right here, here's what would have happened, and like take all the text messages. Um, and so this is this is like how hackers do real growth hacking because normally growth yeah. hacking is done by non-hackers. You guys really uh, show yeah, the art of the possible. <laughs> um, you know, but we didn't have a product back then, and it was really only once we we saw the response and how like you know it's obvious now, but it wasn't obvious then that as people were using smartphones and relying on phones more, mobile phones more and more, that this is like attached to your hip. There was even a Supreme Court case that. I'm paraphrasing here, was like, if a hypothetical Martian came to Earth, they would believe that smartphones were an appendage of people's bodies, given how frequently they, like, you know, they they use them. Um, and I think that's right. And and so we realized that, wow, this is a giant problem, probably not going to go away anytime soon. And if we don't do it, I don't know who will. Um, mm. So, you know what, let's start a company to fix the problem. And, you know, I think that's, you know, the purest form of founding a company is taking a giant problem and saying, let's go fix it, as opposed to saying, hey, how do we make a bunch of money? Um, which oftentimes leads you to things you're either as an entrepreneur not that passionate about, or right. that you're one of many people doing the exact same thing. Um, because honestly, as you well know, you know, running a startup is getting punched in the face every day. It's really hard. First, everyone thinks you're stupid. Then they try to kill you, right? And then maybe like 10 years later, they might think you're successful, right? It's mm, not fun. Mm. Uh, and yeah, and and hey, actually, one entrepreneur was coming. Well, it may not one. be fun, but it sounds like you know. To me, I, I don't know your your experience. You obviously meet was more entrepreneurs. The ones that make the journey fun, right? That those are the ones that that have extra motivation to to go on that's and right. accept the punches, you know, or yeah, you know, right. I mean, I think that's is. part of like the, that's part of the part of the game. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. 
you know, is, if you enjoy the journey, then you'll enjoy it, enjoy it because the, the outcome is, is very long distance away. Um, and then you're, you're, you're right there. Um, so when we started the company, um, our archetypes for a good security company at the time were Symantec and McAfee, which mm-hmm. had the majority of their revenue come in B2B and, you know, some of the revenue come from consumer, you know, the Norton McAfee antiviruses of the world. Mm-hmm. And at that time, there weren't that many business users of smartphones other than BlackBerry, um, which is a sep- was a kind of a separate ecosystem. So we decided to build a consumer product to start. And we set out and started understanding like what problem people had on their smartphones and solve them. This is everything from like losing your phone, losing data, people didn't want malware or getting hacked. Mm-hmm. Um, we built a product that more or less sanded off all the rough edges. And you know the, the key thing that we learned then is maniacal attention to cohort metrics. We were really fortunate that mm-hmm. um, we had several mentors, Kevin Hartz, um, Sean Ellis, who kind of is, you know, both people who kind of early on the, what I would call modern consumer product development world. Sean Ellis is kind of notable for originating growth hacking and what many people now know is the product market fit metric. How disappointed mm-hmm. would you be if you no longer use this product? Um, and then Kevin Hartz, you know, multi-time founder, um, you know, who then was running uh, Eventbrite with Julia Hartz, who's also an incredible thinker. Um, and we were just really fortunate as like really young entrepreneurs to get, you know, to work with folks who were at the top of their game. And, and effectively, had we not had that like very quantitative approach to iterative product development, I, we would have died. Uh, and and sp- very specifically, um, we looked at cohort retention um, and this, this so-called product market fit metric, how disappointed would you be, and figured out what, all the things that were standing in the way of a great experience and then sending them off. Right. And there's no way we would have shipped a product from day one and just like, you know, been successful. Got it right. Got it right. And so the, the end, the end customer that you were optimizing for experience, was that the, at the time was still the consumer that had right. a smartphone at the time or a semi-smart, pretty dumb phones right. at the time. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, it was a yeah, Windows mobile smartphone and then yeah. Android came out and it became the main focus of the business. And Android was the game changer for you guys as it sort of started taking off. What was it? That was sort of the initial wedge. That That's exactly right. When we were kind of bopping around on Windows Mobile, and even though we were one of the larger products on Windows Mobile, there was no app store. It was very hard to download. It's not that many devices in the field. When Android came out, it was completely game changing. And so... Um... When you go back and you kind of say, well, we were focused on the experience, right? And for the user, what, how do you define that outside of that kind of the metric, the end metric of like, okay, you know, I don't need the solution. I need the solution, right? And what were yeah. the sub components of that? Because people, you know, we are obviously running the, the podcast is an experience focus, right? But, but I think there's many elements to it. Yeah. And what did yeah. you find to be the leading indicators of yeah. what that meant? So um, a, a couple things. So I, I tend to look at experience in multiple dimensions. You know, one would be rational or utilitarian. Like, what does it actually do? The other is emotional or um, aesthetic, right? You know, how does it feel? Um, and and I think you have to manage both of them um, in in like complex custom, like customer environments. So for example, um, one of the challenges we had early on was this question of is it doing anything right um so people installed the app and they're like well it's kind of like says everything's okay like but is it working right and uh do you ever remember what's what's there's a shampoo it's like you know it works because it tingles um that that was the phrase we used in, in a lot of our design meetings early on it's like well how does it tingle right if you just have a screen that says it's green and everything's working so what we did is we added this little chart um, that would show all of the events we were analyzing, all the network packets, all of the system events who were looking for for malicious things going on, and that actually increased retention, right? Mm. It's it, it basically had zero. So you needed to problem. remind people that you guys were doing all that work behind the scenes, made exactly. them feel safe, protected, in control of their device yeah. of their life, that, and the right. reminder and, was yeah. the key because you didn't need to do it. You didn't need to do that. Yep. It, it actually hurt performance, right? Because when you open it up, it actually used battery life. So te- on, on a rational basis, it was strictly yeah. speaking negative, right? 
But on an emotional basis, the, the question is, is it working? Am I protected? Actually helped. And of course, most security companies at the time had the hypothesis of you need to scare people. So their logos were red and orange and yellow, mm-hmm. you know, and you would always be this alert. And I'm sure you remember this like back in like the windows, early days of antivirus, you get this really scary alert of like our heuristic detection engine found something different. Wait, yeah. a heuristic detection engine just means, Hey, we don't actually know if it's bad. It means we're kind of guessing based on some other things. So it's like, first of all, they're using scary technical terms. There's big red X's everywhere. And, and that's how they scared you into believing that it's working. And that was just so antithetical to how we thought it should work. So our logo was green. In large friendly letters at the top right of the screen was the, were the words, everything is okay. And we showed, here's what we're monitoring. And the graph color was also green. Everything's good. We're, we're, we're checking it out. That's smart. Because our That's hypothesis smart. is that we want people to believe and understand that they're safe, not to scare them into like buying something because they're afraid. And, and because, you know, I would say almost all product design is really just how do you understand cons- like psychology? And mm-hmm. our belief at the time, and I think it played out, is people actually trust you more over the time and are willing to pay you more when they trust you versus people when they're afraid will do almost anything to not be afraid, but they don't trust you anymore. So that's not a good way to build a long-term experience, right? And you, and you see this you know, in, in security marketing, right? If you scare someone, like you know, insurance companies or travel insurance sometimes has the same sort of property. Oh, your trip's not protected, right? And you can get someone to transact once. But if you're trying to build a really long-term customer relationship, it's not a good way to do that. You're you're in general in life, and it sounds like in customer work, you want to build a game of multiple interactions, right? And so I think that's what you're describing. Then you want to build these habits. And you brought up the shampoo, and I'm thinking of another psychology pattern where when when people are designing the uh, tooth tooth, uh, paste, Right. Yeah. They're giving you a sense, um, you know, not, not just for cleaning the teeth, but like the f- sense of feeling fresh, a little freshness the in mint. the flavor. Right. The mint flavor, which indicates that something is working and it gives you something distinct as a pleasure. And it was ab- absolutely unnecessary for the purposes of actually protecting your teeth. But it does yeah. this sort of psychological uh, repeat sensation. Uh, That's right. So I think you guys are very sophisticated. You're at the level of CPG. And then and then if I understand the story correctly, eventually monetization moved you in the enterprise um, for the solution. So guide us a little bit, kind of like why people are so brilliant at getting the, the consumers to love, you know, the, the offering. Why did you decide to move the business in the enterprise? Yeah. So so we we always knew that what we were doing was important for enterprises. And I would also say mid-market and small businesses as well, like protecting the data on or accessible to your device as more devices access cloud services, you need to do that. So the question is when and how. Uh, Early on, you know, early, like most businesses just didn't allow that much access to to data from their mobile device, like email only. So, Consumer was really the only market that people really, really cared. Over time, we saw as more enterprises did real computing, access to all of their sensitive crown jewels from their mobile Mm -hmm. device, did the security requirements become stronger. And we started getting pulled. You see, you know, enterprises saying, hey, let's, you know, can we we get like a multiple, multiple person license for Lookout in the enterprise? And then questions like, hey, we're really worried about data leaking off of our device. And, you know, it might be a totally reasonable file sharing product, but if enterprise data is going from our enterprise data store into your personal account, that's actually a really big deal, you know, particularly if it's cross-border or there's sensitive information mm-hmm. in healthcare, or finance, or otherwise, um, how do we how do we manage all that? And so you have all these other business-only use cases. And that really started like about six or seven years ago, um, where we getting pulled into that direction. And so we really had multiple polarities of the business. Um, And then I would say the other thing that started to happen is it became less about simply defending the device, but more about defending the enterprise, the data, the applications that are accessible via device. Um, Mm. And so we, you know, if you look at a lot of our focus today at Lookout, it's, you know, of course we, we stop phishing and malicious websites um, and data leakage and, and bad apps. But also, it's how do we ensure that anytime it, something touches corporate data, that it's up to date, it's compliant, 
It has the right security controls. And that's where actually where a lot of our move is towards like cloud security. And mm-hmm. in B, we've even extended towards like Mac and Windows laptops and tablets um, because you, you want to have a unified uh, security posture across all of your devices. Uh, and so if you would have asked me back then, did I think enterprise security across all devices would be where we go? I'd say maybe, but you know, it, it just shows we follow the needs of our customers and just continually try to invest ahead and, and not just sell a product, but actually solve a problem. And so tell me about your transition, right? Like you start, you're CTO of this, of the business, right? So you're kind of hacker's hacker, you know, so to speak, right? Or the good, the, the, the good side of it, obviously. Yeah. And then you're, you know, when, when I interact with you, um, you know, the, the, the feedback that we get from your other fans, like you're, um, you know, very, um, you know, non-stereotypical engineer, very empathetic, very patient with people way smarter than yourself, like my, like me, for example, right? Like, you know, they basically like really are, you know, very polished as an executive in this sort of environment. And now obviously you're investing in, in startups and, you know, helping them move across different, different businesses, uh, business directions. Some of them, you know, very well, some of them are relatively new areas for you. So how do you kind of maintain this humility, um, kind of grow yourself, like whether it was, was lookout, you know, in making that kind of trans- transition from a small business to, to kind of a business that serves the enterprises and then the transition into the VC world where, yeah. you know, you're, you're not coming across as somebody who's like, okay, I'm just a, you know, super technical person and I don't care how, you know, how people experience me, I have the right answers, right? Like, which is sort of a stereotype perhaps of, yeah. of somebody, you know, who comes from, from your, from, from, from the sophisticated technical background like you do. Well, you should have met me in my twenties. Um, <laughs> and and I, I say that in jest, but, you know, I would say like, like everyone, you, you have an arc, right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I would say it's probably a little bit more stereotypical straight ahead, uh, you know, aggressive, you know, personality in early days. And I would say is I'm very grateful for some of the folks that look out and, you know, around look out and personal mentors that, you know, that helped me, you know, develop, I would say as a, as a kind of fully rounded human being. And and thank you for those who were very patient with me when I was, uh, uh, I was maybe a little bit less, uh, less, less polished. Um, I would also say that if you think about the career arc of engineers mm-hmm. um, and you talk to like really experienced uh, VPs of engineering and CTOs, and I've been fortunate to work with several of them, like Ahmed, who was a CTO for, or sorry, VP of engineering at Lookout for a long time. And a lot of like the really senior engineers, the development areas are on human interaction, soft skills, because there's a limit to just simply knowing technology deeper. It is, of course, a, a, a necessary, but not sufficient. Mm-hmm. Because if you know the technology extremely well, you can be extremely effective. But if you can also interact with others and teach, you know, folks that are that are, are less experienced and more junior folks and have an impact beyond yourself. And that was the thing that I really learned of like, there's the limit to how much I can do personally. Mm-hmm. And I would say as I'm still kind of on, on, I would say on the journey on, on all fronts, both the interpersonal and the intellectual side to, to, to be more effective. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, definitely with some combination of self-reflection and hard feedback. And, you know, I spent a lot of time reading about human psychology and why it's actually kind of funny. I, I, I joke, it's like, I understand humans in software mode. It, like the, so you uh, really, you use your analytical skills to understand the I human. It's uh, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> it makes sense, right? If you, if you take a broad enough view and understand, here's why people act the way they do in our evolutionary context. And you understand the cognitive bias we have that actually make a lot of sense. I think cognitive bias gets a lot a bad rap because it can lead you astray. But in many ways, it actually is optimal. Evolution is like a lot of optimization pressure getting us there and understanding Mm -hmm. why that's okay and that we are emotional creatures and that is okay. And you have to meet people where they are um, because life's hard. And 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 when you when you kind of add that to technical skills. I think you, you can get technical leaders that are extremely effective outside mm-hmm. of just technology. And, you know, I'm also an investor in many venture funds of people I deeply respect and, and kind of have that, you know, call that like rational and emotional 
um, sides to them because I think you 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 have to be if you want to be effective in in society. So so let's talk about your investment transition, right? Like you were you don't toot your horn on Twitter that much, and you're you're not like hyperactive and in the forums. But when you speak to insiders, and when insiders do the survey of like who are the most influential um, early stage investors, you consistently come up on top ten list. Uh, of 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 those folks and your your track record across multiple funds now was ten unicorns is remarkable. So tell us about this transition and you know what what kind of prompted you to start investing and where do you see you know the the recipe that's that's driving some of the success for you personally, especially since you're not you know out there self promoting at all. And you know I was just looking up like there's not a ton of you know. Uh, podcast interviews of you so I'm very delighted that kind of you you decided to do it with us yeah <laughs> um well I mean I think first of all several things I, I I've just been really fortunate to work with strong entrepreneurs and you know when I moved to San Francisco in was it 2009 yeah um it was just a very formative time and the new platform shifts it was motivated people and and there's just a lot of things in the ether there that you know I can trace a lot of strong investments to friends, you know, or other people who were just in the ecosystem at that time and that are now running large companies or working at companies or investing. And, and I, and I do think there is, you know, there is something to be said about deal flow being a causal factor to could investment success. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm fortunate that, you know, I would say I got lucky to some extent. I mean, there, there's always some combination of like luck, hard work and, and preparation for opportunity um and you know teasing them apart is impossible unless you can can like split the timeline um but let's just call it luck for now um as i mentioned at the beginning introduction you're very humble so that so <laughs> you're 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 invalidating that but yes let's let's say it's luck um well i, I also think like believing anything other than you can make a mistake and blow yourself up is actually unhelpful so re regardless of whether the truth is like you know it's it's a helpful belief that, hey, everything is luck and you have to work really hard. Sorry. All right. Um, uh, because I think it saves you from like believing your own bullshit um, or or thinking you're good or less than your laurels or pick your metaphor there. And, you know, and the reason I honestly started investing early was I mentioned some of those people who are formative at Lookout. And frankly, I was just really grateful. And mm -hmm. the only reason like the Silicon Valley, you know, success story is what it is, is because when people see success, they give back to the next generation. And so for me, it's like as a recipient of a tremendous amount of like unearned help from people, mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I, I have to do this to the next generation because otherwise the story ends. Uh, so in 2013, you know, like many, many people it didn't, didn't have that much money, but had a little bit of money. So I started investing in other startups and I didn't intend to start a fund. I just thought it would be kind of fun mm -hmm. doing my duty. And then over the next couple of years, I was like, wow, I actually really like this. This is fun. And I, you know, I would say very fortunate to have discovered what makes me happy. And, and, you know, I think happiness, if you look at, you know, that like more from like a, what actually makes people happy. Uh, it's not usually if you ask them say, what makes you happy? And they say this, them it's what on a Tuesday morning and you do it, that journey that you mentioned earlier actually delights you. And I, I was fortunate to find early that two things make me happy. Mm. Like I'm an engineer. And I like building things. I like my hands dirty, right? If I'm if I'm not involved in something, uh, I, I go crazy. At the same time, though, if I'm only doing one thing, like my intellectual curiosity, it feels like it's sitting on the bench and I also go crazy. Right. So I learned that I need to do some level of building and some level of helping people build. And if I do those two things in my life, I am you know happy as a clam. And and so that was kind of the genesis of start of of in turning from a little bit of angel investing to like, Hey, let me actually start a fund while still working at lookout. Um, and that was the genesis of SNR one. Um, and you, most people don't know the fund name cause I've purposefully kept a low profile. Um, because, you know, I think the thing I've learned in venture is that there's a thousand ways to do it. Right. And there's no one right answer or wrong answer. The question is what's authentic to you that you can do for multiple decades. Because the thing about venture is I think it does take decades both to see returns, but also to like get good. And so if it's not something, if you, if it's a, Hey, I want to get rich and I want to invest in some unicorn, like it's probably not going to happen. Maybe it will, but like mm -hmm. most likely 
take a decade for it actually to impact you, right? And so if it's not something you really enjoy and like really enjoy helping founders and like really digging into tough, meaty problems, you know, I don't think you're going to be good at it. And, you know, for me, I'm not, I'm not someone who really enjoys, you know, having my name out there all the time and uh, whatnot. I really enjoy spending time with founders working through problems. And, and I would say, if you look at where investing people spend their time, it's everything from like, how do you source? How do you evaluate? How do you win? How do you help? Um, and then how do you run your firm and how do you raise money? Like I, I like helping and evaluating. Right. Mm. Um, and so I basically have designed my life. So I almost nothing other than those two things is how I spend my time. And so, you know, what, what I think happens in the venture ecosystem and as a, if, if you just are a good person and help, it puts you up in like the 95th percentile of investors. Cause most people just don't help. Like they don't respond right. to emails. Um, and if you just show up and help and are, are like ethical and moral for like a decade, deal flow takes care of itself. Um, and I guess I'm fortunate that, you know, that, you know, to be in an ecosystem where if you, you just follow, follow that, then, you know, good things will eventually come. I can vouch for the moment SVB disaster happened. You were one of the first emails that I received asking, Hey, how can I help? How are you doing? And that was, that was actually like very pleasant, right? Like to, to just get that, you know, caring was out, you know, well, was offered to, hear, to help. I, I still remember that. I think I aged like a decade those few days, but yeah. um, I'm glad, glad to hear myself. But, you know, again, it's, it's, you know, I, if I could send a message to every investor on the planet, it's just, just show up and help, right? And, you know, and it's not necessarily like forcing help, but just making sure you actually respond yeah. to investor updates. There's nothing worse than shouting in the ether and having no one respond. Yeah. I could, I could feel, I feel very much that authenticity that you're, that you're describing um, kind of in, in every interaction that we had. So congratulations on finding something that makes you be your, yourself and enjoy, enjoy what you're doing, because then, you know, what else? What else is there to do? You know, like how how would you improve in something that you hate doing? And so it sounds like you've you've engineered your you've engineered your investment in the way that um, maximizes your talents and your pa- and and what you really you know. But that's the goal. I mean, you know, it's want to live for, yeah. right? Yeah, sweep the floors. Um, but uh, you know, I feel feel fortunate. So how so? You know, obviously, then you you get a lot of inbound, um, but you you still made a few pretty remarkable bets. Like one of the companies we love that you invested in is Airtable. Um, we we embedded in in relate to, and and so sort of we could we love seeing this kind of as a format um, inside us. So tell us, like, how did you know, you know, as as that example or some other, like, how do you know that yes, I want to be in this, right? It's still you know, pretty early stages that you invest in typically. And so there's a lot of um, uncertainties. What are what are your heuristics, to use a big word, yep. uh, in helping you make that, those decisions? Yeah, so I think several things. At the very earliest stages, you're underwriting, not analyzing. And I, I use those words very precisely. Analyzing is looking at past metrics and trying to divine what something is worse. This is what public market investors do underwriting this is what insurance people do they're trying to understand the possibility of future events transpiring mm-hmm. and at early stage it's like there's no revenue to, to, to analyze you're trying to understand where is risk and i think the best venture capital investments are those where you have a accurate understanding of risk particularly where those others have an inaccurate understanding of risk and as the company succeeds and shows where the real risk is and isn't then you are rewarded based on the, the valuation of the company or the eventually like the liquidity of the company being reflected there. And I think that's like a very exact circumstance there. And so like, okay, what are the, what are the factors you have to underwrite? Certainly mm. a human, mm. right? Because, or humans, because the early team, everyone's again, like we talked about earlier, people are going to tell you you're an idiot. They're going to hate you. It's really, 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 really hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and, is the team going to stick through it? Is there some reason that they're going to run through walls for this company or are they just trying to get rich quick? Um, the latter almost never leads to success. Second is, are they doing something that's going to be important to their customers? This could be consumers, this could be businesses, right. but it's not important. Um, why does it matter? Third, you know, are there a lot of them, right? This is the so-called market size. And, and notably, I like thinking about 
the individual customer, how much it's worth to them and how many of them are there versus like going to some analyst firm and, and asking them to analyze it. Because I found that bottom-up psychology is a much more reliable way of figuring out when markets are changing or technology is changing what people will believe. Because, you know, I would say looking at top-down caggers of markets, it's always going to be a trailing indicator. And in, in venture capital, we deal with underwriting leading things, not analyzing trailing things. Um, and then, you know, to the extent there's, is there evidence that the, like the product they're, they're building has product market fit? And, mm -hmm. and I use that precisely, meaning do those customers actually like the product as it is today? And it's okay. Oftentimes we're investing pre-product, right? Mm -hmm. It's a hypothesis. And of course, um, you know, the, the valuation at the time reflects the risk of developing product market fit. Then a company moves towards, hey, we've achieved product market fit. We have people or companies who like what we're doing. They're willing to pay us. Now the question is, can we reach more of them? And that's the quest for repeatability. Right. Um, and after you do that, you just say, hey, yep, we can get people who reliably try it, like it, use it. Then this quest of scalability. Can we raise money, deploy it in growth efficiently, and then effect effectively have this model where we put in a dollar and three dollars comes out, right? And that's that's a scalable company. And once you achieve that, you're usually you know ready for to be go public. Um, and but like most of the time, at, at least for me, I deal with this pre product market fit or product market fit. And so directly answer your question um, with respect to Airtable, you had the team, you know Howie and team who super smart in it for the right reasons. And I if you look back at some of the early things they wrote. The reason for existence of Airtable was to empower non-software engineers to have the productivity and the power that software engineers have achieved. So it's a mm -hmm. beautiful vision, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it is allowing everyone, not just highly educated engineers, to participate in the uh, in like the, the efficiency gains and in, and truly the like the overall like wealth creation of software. Right. And, and it's, it's like a very like radical vision, right. Um, and to, to allow that to be accessed by everybody. And then in doing so, they had a very particular vision of merging the concept of a spreadsheet in a database where spreadsheets are unstructured. Mm -hmm. um, so like one, one sheet that is orders another one's customers, and they're not really linked together and you can screw it up all the time. Database highly structured, but also very hard to use. Um, and it's like, very hard to change and, and whatnot. And so by making the ease of use of a spreadsheet but with the relational power of a database, um, they produce something that ordinary people can, can model very complex workflows. And indeed, mm -hmm. my entire investment firm effectively runs on Airtable. Mm -hmm. I know many companies like mm -hmm. really large scale who run on Airtable, right? It's, it's pretty incredible. Um, and back then a lot of people said, oh, you're never going to beat Excel, right? And right, people right. Didn't Right. Whereas if you actually live, hey, this solves the problem. You have a team that's willing to do it. And if they do it, you know, the so-called what could go right, this is going to run. This could be this, huge. This is all yeah, yeah right. you, you can run it too. Right. And that, that was the hypothesis. So now um, the, the AI is the new kind of no code, right? Like it's sort of like as, as the kind of the buzzword of the, of the day. You've been investing for some time. You've had you know, the waves of AI, you know, before, uh, before the generative AI of now, like what's your take and how would you, how do you help, um, you know, the rest of the world kind of interpret the future? And, you know, right now you're making these bets in an area that's a little bit hyped up. So how do you yeah. just discern the, the real deal from the, from the hoopla of the moment? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I like thinking in principles. Because the principles don't change. Um, mm -hmm. At the end of the day, a business has to delight their customers, um, and you know usually do so in a way that the customers feels like it's a fair shake for how much they're paying for the product, and the company mm -hmm. can't you know charge more for the product than it costs to make it, and that's their profit, and that's that's a good business. So, the question is, how does AI change companies? My view is that AI allows companies to either serve their customers better by allowing mm -hmm. new features pre previously unthought of or increase their margins with the same service or um, reduce their costs, preserving their margins. 
right? And there's different reasons why companies might want to do one or the other, but at, at the end of the day, it's all business principles. That, like it just comes right. back fundamentals. to fundamentals. Yeah. Yeah. This time it's different is BS. Um, so now the question is, okay, well, how does a particular company do that? And that's like, that's a very hard question, but I think that, you know, anytime you have a workflow that you can deliver better customer experience, people are usually either going to pay more or you're going to be able to like take a market share from your competitors if you do it and they don't. Or if you can, um, you know, do more um, because, oh, let's just say, hey, you have a, like an operations team and, you know, they needed to put in like one calorie of work per unit of customer value. All of a sudden, you can eat that same one calorie of work and deliver three units of customer value. So in, actually, in many cases, I think people, you know, will say, oh, well, AI will eliminate jobs. I think the opposite might happen is that uh, AI means you have the same number of jobs, but people just have a lot more prosperity. Right. And I think that's, you know, kind of if you look at the history of technology, it's not like in the technology in the last several hundred years that we have massive unemployment. We don't. Right. Mm. In fact, we still have, we argue work more now than we did the, a couple hundred years ago in, in a lot of industries, but we our quality of living is just that much better. And we can and if you one of my favorite measurements is um these so-called time prices, which you measure how many minutes of work does it take to get a pound of ham or a, a pound mm. of copper or a square foot of an apartment. And if you look at like almost every one of these measures, mm. we are getting more prosperous in all income levels across basically everywhere in the world. You know, it takes less minutes to get a pound of ham or a, a thing of broccoli or, you know, or some copper than it did 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago. And I feel like AI, if we just really zoom out, we'll just continue this trend of increased human prosperity. Super interesting. Kevin, I know I'm conscious of time, but I, I think one of the things that comes out is you're you're very positive. And a lot of people, even though we're living in these best of times, tend to be down. Like, oh my God, there's a recession here. There's this here. So what inspires you? Where do you look for guidance? Whether it's you know a, a leader that you follow or one of your books, go-to books to put things in perspective for yourself. You know, what what keeps you aligned and grounded the way the way you are, you know, here in this, in this conversation, even. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, there's, there, there's all sorts of material, uh, founders podcast is quite good, uh, works in progress, you know, that, you know, it's formalized the study of progress, I think is, is quite good. Um, and, and, and really, I think understanding what does the evidence tell us? about how economies work and how technology works versus what are our biases. Mm -hmm. um, and because I think we, like back to what we started off, there's a rational and emotional component to everything. Mm -hmm. Change is scary. So let's not dismiss the emotional scariness of change, but at the same time, let's make sure we understand rationally how change tends to have transpired. So for example, one thing we also know is when you have periods of technological change, you, you do have a lot of disruption mm -hmm. and there is when you have jobs eliminated or particularly like in the factory towns in the US, you have higher rates of substance abuse, mortality, like really bad stuff. And we have to take that seriously. At the same time, you don't wanna give up the benefits of change because you know there's an argument that like billions of lives have been saved because we have enough calories on the planet now, right? Was it painful to like make those changes and were there economic structures disrupted? Absolutely. But if you think about it, like, would you save billions of lives or preserve a economic structure? You're like, we should probably save billions of lives. Billions think going lives, forward, save yeah. lives, create more Beethovens and Einsteins, exactly. uh, you know, so prosper. absolutely. Right. That's right. So we, we should, at least again, my, my view is if you, if you, you know, kind of look in a lot of that ecosystem of the folks I mentioned, there's a lot of both historical context and perspective around how do we respect and understand the emotional challenge and indeed some of the economic challenges that will hit very particular people whose lives or economic structures are disrupted by technological change and then figure out what we can do both as a society for companies uh, for employers to help that transition be as graceful as possible at the same time not losing the forest through the trees and saying hey human prosperity is a very important thing that we need to take seriously and you know and making sure that we don't hamstring prosperity for billions of people because we are afraid of dealing with a, you know a short-term tough consequence and 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 I do believe you can actually have your cake and eat it too where you you can help folks doing these transitions 
um, but while at the same time, you know, having the benefit of prosperity. And of course, that's a much longer conversation for another day. Well, I hope there's going to be another day very soon. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. This has been really fascinating. And I feel one of the reasons why I wanted to start the podcast is to share with the world some of the amazing conversations that I've had on my entrepreneurial journey. And, you know, chatting with you is always a pleasure. So uh, I've learned a lot from this and I hope our audience has benefited from from you as well. Kevin, what's the, I know you keep low profile, but what's the best way to, to, to find you and where? Um, yeah, I would say the honest, the honest answer is nowhere. <laughs> nowhere. You're not to be found. Understood. Yeah. They, yeah. they, except for legal listen to you here. Well, Kevin, yeah. thank you so much for joining. Yeah. Thanks, Take Alex. care. Bye-bye. Yeah.